Hello Year 3 and 4, um, I'm about to read you the next chapter of The Boy Who Bite the World. Now this one is called Adventures in the Andes. It's a long one, so get comfy. Occasionally Tom passed a lone farmhouse, miles from any other building. It must be peaceful to live out here, he thought, but it might get a bit boring or lonely too. Whenever a farmer spotted Tom, he would invite him inside for a bowl of soup and a drink of Marte. This is the South American version of a cup of tea. Marte, though, is always drunk through a silver straw from a ball-shaped cup. Everyone shares the same cup and the same straw, passing them on to the next person. Marte is a drink to share and an excuse to have a long chat with your friends. In every country around the world, the people Tom met were kind, curious, generous and welcoming. Patagonia was no exception. This was one of the most beautiful regions he had ever cycled through. It was wild and free and unfamiliar. The very things that, for Tom, made for the most thrilling adventures. Sometimes the road ran through valleys. Sometimes it climbed high in the mountains, clinging to the edge of the cliffs. The roads didn't have safety barriers. So if Tom fell off his bike, he would also fall off a massive cliff. It was scary riding, but exciting. Turquoise rivers rushed through green forests. Trout leaped to catch flies. Each night, Tom jumped into a river to wash. The rivers flowed down from the mountains, thundering over waterfalls, carrying melted snow. They were freezing. In some parts of the world, Tom didn't get to wash for weeks on end. So he was often quite smelly. A chance to get clean in a mountain stream was too good to miss, even if the cold water did make him scream a bit. Jump in the river, it'll make you shiver. Green fields carpeted with daisies and dandelions reminded Tom of England. Then Aria ran across the road, reminding him that he was actually very far from home. The Rhea is a huge bird, like an ostrich, it stopped and looked in surprise. It had never seen a boy on a bicycle before. Mind you, Tom had never seen a Rhea before. It was taller than Tom himself. Rheas cannot fly, but they run really quickly, up to 40 miles per an hour. Another evening, as he watched the sun set, a little armadillo trotted hastily past Tom's tent. Armadillos sleep for 16 hours a day. So it was a treat to see one actually out and about looking for food. Mountains towered above, jagged like sharp teeth, with mighty glaciers running down from the peaks. Glaciers are formed over hundreds of years as snow is compressed and turns into ice. Glaciers are like enormous rivers of ice, but rivers that move so slowly that you can't see them move. Three quarters of all the fresh water in the world is frozen into glaciers. Tom looked up at the end of a glacier, a gigantic wall of ice in a bright blue lake. Every so often, a chunk would fall into the water 60 metres below. Gigantic blocks of ice, as big as cars, crashed down into the lake with a sound like an exploding bomb. As they hit the lake, they made massive splashes causing huge waves. It was great fun. Tom settled down with a couple of banana sandwiches to watch the show. The road now was nothing more than a stony track and Tom's bags rattled as he bounced along. There were no bridges. So sometimes he had to cross rivers. Tom would take off his shoes and socks and roll up his trousers above his knees. Then he would push the heavy bike through the freezing water taking care not to lose his footing. If he fell over, he would not only get very cold and wet and cross, he might also be swept away by the strong current. After a few more days, the track fizzled out completely. Tom felt alone, but not lonely. He felt excited. He had been riding around the world for a long time now. He was fit and strong. He knew how to repair his bike if it broke down. 
He knew how to read a map and how to survive in the wild. This was a wilderness challenge and Tom was up for it. For a whole day, Tom pushed his bike up a small, steep, muddy footpath. Hour after hour, mile after mile. The forest around him was dark. Sometimes he had to carry his bike and bags and tripped over rocks and roots. It was exhausting. When he eventually reached the top of the track, he saw a tall metal post. It was old and rusty. Nobody had been there for a long time. On one side of the post was written the word Argentina. On the other side of the post was written the word Chile. This was the border crossing between two countries. Tom had crossed 30 international borders on his journey around the world. But this was the first time that the border had never been on a muddy footpath, or sorry, had ever been on a muddy footpath on top of a hill. There were no barriers or police checkpoints. He was wet, cold and tired. But Tom still had the energy to smile and punch the air. Yes! He shouts to himself, that's one more country done. He freewheeled free slowly down the track, away from Argentina and into Chile, down towards a lake dotted with small icebergs. He could not go very fast for two reasons. The first was that the track was too rocky to go quickly without shaking his bike to pieces. The second reason was that Tom was now sharing the track with an enormous ball. He didn't know where the ball had come from and he didn't know where it was going, but he did know that the ball was huge and ferocious looking. Every so often the ball turned around, looked at Tom and snorted loudly. He didn't want to shout, hurry up, or try to overtake him on the narrow track. So Tom had to settle for trundling along behind the ball until they reached the lake. The next morning, Tom had a lion. He had to wait to catch a boat across the lake to the other side, as it was the only way he could continue heading north. He could lie lazily in his sleeping bag for as long as he wanted. The trouble was that Tom didn't know how long he might have to wait. In fact, Nobody seemed to know. The boat arrived about every two weeks, but nobody he asked knew anything more than that. It was a relaxed way of life down in Patagonia. The boat did not come that day. So Tom had a line the next morning too, and the morning after that. He threw stones at icebergs, went and said hello to the bull, and washed his clothes in the freezing lake. He was getting bored, sitting beside the lake, waiting. So Tom was happy on the morning of day four when he awoke to the chug chug sound of a boat. Leaping out of his sleeping bag, he ran to the water's edge, waving and shouting. The captain of the yellow and blue boat changed direction in order to come and pick him up. Tom hurried to pack his gear and wheel it down to the lake. Everything he owned, including his house, could pack away into just a few bags ready to move on to the next adventure. It's surprising how few things you really need in life. The fewer things Tom had, the happier he was. Hola, he called to the captain. How are you, sir? Tom hadn't seen another person for days and was happy to have a chat. He was also looking forward to reaching the town across the lake because he had been rationing his food and was now really hungry. Let's go, cried Tom, heaving his bike on board. I'm hungry. Tom pedalled further north, the huge peaks of the Andes Mountains, the biggest in the Americas, rose up ahead of him. They were formed millions of years ago. The plates of the Earth's surface pushed against each other all the time, extremely slowly, but with massive force. Hold your hands out flat in front of you. Touch your fingertips together. 
Now push them harder and harder together. Okay, so if you hold them flat in front of you, touch your fingertips together. Oh, and push them harder and harder. And eventually, oh, eventually they will slide one over the other, buckle downwards or buckle upwards like a mountain range. This is how mountains grow. The Andes seem to buckle halfway to the sky. Tom had never seen mountains as big as these. He gulped. His legs felt wobbly and weak. The road climbed ever, ever more steeply upwards, past trees and prickly cacti before disappearing into the clouds. The mountain pass above him was 5,000 metres high and Tom had to ride over it on his bike. The road zigzagged up the twisting bends. Sweat dripped into Tom's eyes. He was panting. It would take about two days to ride up this pass. He didn't think he could do it. His legs were wobbling like jelly and he was even hungrier than usual. So, as he always did when things seemed impossible, Tom climbed off his bike and sat down to make a banana sandwich. In a few bites, the sandwich was gone. Then Tom lay down and folded his hands behind his head. It was time for an after lunch nap. High in the sky, a bird hovered on the warm thermal air that rose from the valley. Condors, giant vultures are enormous, almost as big as Tom's friend, Albert the Albatross. Tom let rip an enormous, noisy burp into the quiet mountain air. I'm not gonna do that one for you, you can imagine. When you're alone and cycling around the world, you can get away with doing very loud burps. Back on his bike, as the road climbed, the temperature fell. Even though cycling was hot work, Tom needed to pull out an extra jumper. He was wearing thick gloves, a warm hat under his helmet, and both his pairs of socks. Up, down, up, down went Tom's legs. Up, up, up crept his bike. On and on and on he pedalled. Down, down, down crept the distance to the top. A fox in its white fur coat flopped through the snow next to the road. The snow was too deep for it to walk through. So the fox was jumping forward, then sinking. Jumping forward, then sinking. It looked even more tiring than cycling up the big mountain. Tom remembered the lesson this adventure had taught him. When you think you cannot do something big and difficult, do something tiny and easy instead. Take one little step. Push the pedals round once. You can do that. Push the pedals one more time. Then once more. You can always do one more. Ever so slowly, Tom realised that the road was beginning to flatten out. He was almost at the top. His head was hurting and his legs were wobbling. But he had made it to the top. Tom had ridden all the way up a 5,000 metre mountain pass. There will be more mountain passes to come. But doing the first one is always the most difficult. He stopped at the top to take a photograph of himself and his bike. Then he quickly put on every piece of spare clothing he had. It's always cold high up in the mountains. Camping last night, Tom had had to light a campfire to help keep himself warm. At the top of the pass, it was minus 20 degrees. The coldest temperature Tom had ever experienced. He even put his spare pair of pants on top of his head, of, of, on top of his hat, to help keep his head warm. Oh, I'll put my head up. Just to keep me warm. He looked very, very silly with a pair of pants on his head. But it was too cold to care. Nobody was around to laugh anyway. The boy climbed back onto his bike to enjoy his reward for cycling up the mountain. His reward was the fun of zooming down the other side. Woohoo! Tom howled. 
freewheeling faster and faster. Everything passed in a high speed blur. He freewheeled downhill for 50 miles. It would take about an hour to go that far in a car or days if you were walking. Think of a town that is 50 miles away from where you live. And now imagine being able to get there on your bike without even having to pedal. Tom's face was fixed into a grin. Riding downhill was the best bit of cycling round the world. Would you like to be strong enough to cycle over the immense Andes for month after month? It's easier than it sounds. There is no shortcut or magic potion to getting fit without putting in hours of hard work. But if you ride your bike a lot, or run, or swim, or play sport regularly, then you will become fit and strong. Tom knew that all children need to do at least one hour of exercise a day. Something that gets you tired, hot and out of breath. But he was doing a lot more than that. Okay everyone, I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Whew, Tom is so adventurous, isn't he? I wonder where you would like to travel to if you could on your bike. Enjoy, see you later. Hello, this chapter is called The Witches of La Paz. La Paz is one of the highest cities in the world. It lies in a massive bowl-shaped dip in the earth, surrounded by mountains. As with many cities in poor countries, a huge shanty town has sprouted up on the outskirts. Almost one million people live here in homes ranging from small cement blocks to shelters with roofs made of plastic sheets. He thought of his own home in England and felt thankful that he did not have to live in a homemade shelter on the edge of a busy road. Away from the main roads, the streets in the centre of La Paz were steep and cobbled. Market stalls were squeezed into the narrow streets, adding to the chaos and the noise. Small children had the responsibility of trying to sell the few spare vegetables that their parents had brought to the city from their farms. They needed money to buy the things they could not grow themselves. They crouched on the pavement next to their sacks of carrots, chilies, and other vegetables. Some smiled as Tom as he passed. Others were too busy trying to make a sale that they didn't have time to chat. The best place to chat to local people is in a cafe. Whenever Tom was in a town, he always ate in cafes. Banana sandwiches are the food of heroes. But whenever possible, he did try to eat a variety of foods, as he knew that to be really fit and strong, it was important to eat a good mixture of fresh foods. Tom usually enjoyed trying new foods in different countries, but still shuddered when he remembered the blood and milk mixture or the fly burgers in Africa. Ooh. The cafes he ate in throughout South America were simple places, with just a few small tables and plastic chairs. There was always a radio playing loud music and there was never a menu to choose from. You just ate whatever food had been cooked that day. Often this was a big bowl of chicken soup. When he dug down to the bottom of the bowl with his spoon, Tom would find the day's surprise ingredient. Perhaps a few pieces of potato, perhaps some chunks of carrot. But one part of the chicken soup was never a surprise. There was always a chicken's foot floating on top. Local people thought this was the best bit. Una pata de pollo, in case you've ever wanted to order one yourself. They slurped and said, mmm, as they happily sucked on the scaly foot. Tom, understandably, was not so keen. But an easy way to make friends in those cafes was to give your chicken's foot to another customer to enjoy. One of the spookiest places in La Paz was an old witch's market. Many people in Bolivia still believe in ancient medicines, spells and superstitions to bring them luck or to help them recover from illness. The market was a fascinating but quite creepy place. Tom pushed his bike among the stalls, squeezing through the noisy crowds as stall owners shouted out the health benefits of whatever they were trying to sell. There were candles 
and incense to use at funerals. There were sacks filled with dry herbs, piles of leaves and berries, and a dusty pile of old, dead armadillos. These were the ingredients for the magic spells. There were also large heaps of dead baby llamas. These had been dried in the hot sunshine until they were shriveled and flat. Some people believe that if you are building a new house, you should bury a dead llama in the foundations to bring you good luck to the new home. Tom shivered. <laughs> When he put up his tent each night, he definitely didn't want a dead llama nearby, even if it was supposed to bring him luck. It was time to ride. He bought a big bunch of bananas and pedalled out of La Paz. And there, my friends, is a lovely picture of him doing just that. <laughs>